Christians are living below their privileges. Christians are living below their privileges. Could it be that if we were to all die and go to heaven right now as Christians, God might say to each one of us, why wouldn't you let me bless you like I wanted to? Why didn't you step over that line and begin, begin to live the life that I wanted to give to you? A life of victory, a life of peace and joy, no matter what may come your way. The world we live in is full of unhappy and unsatisfied people. And I have found this out every, ever since I've been in the ministry. People everywhere are looking answers for the emptiness they feel on the inside. We have people who come to our church every week, and I'm sure some of those have that empty void on the inside looking to fill that void with something. Well, this explains why there is so much divorce in the land, so much suicide and thoughts of suicide, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, criminal behavior, prostitution, depression, pornography, eating disorders, psychological disorders, and disrespect all over the land. Our society in the year 2023 seems to be so messed up. So the, the question is this, how do I find happiness? How do I find satisfaction in my life? Could it be through materialism? And we're going to read the scripture in a minute. Friend, materialism will wear out. You'll have to go buy another one or some more another ones. We get a big bar and put all of our stuff in it. So we think we might have our stuff all of our lives. Friend, I want to tell you the happiness and fulfillment is not in materialism. It is not in wealth or pleasure or power and for sure not in religion. A little girl went to visit her grandmother one weekend and her grandmother was a member of a church that it was very strict. They made a rule that nobody on Sunday could laugh, they could not play, they could not work, and they could not have any fun. So the little girl spent the weekend with her grandmother on Sunday morning. They got to go to church. And so, but Sunday morning when the little girl got up, she began to play and laugh like all little girls do. And so the grandmother immediately got on to her and it got her real quiet. They went to church. They came home. They ate lunch. The little girl went out to the barn and she saw a mule out there with a long, sad face. She looked at that mule for a little bit and she said, Mr. Mule, you look like you might be a member of my grandmother's church. Now, friend, when we come to church, I want you to know that we ought to be already thinking and knowing that God's going to bless us. And when we leave here, we ought to look like people who have been worshiping together. I mean, friend, we shouldn't look worse when we go out than we do before we come in. People need to know that we've been to church and we go out and we share the love of God and you go to a restaurant and Christians ought to be the best tippers, by the way. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Well, some college students were asked to write about life. One student wrote this, life is a joke that isn't even funny. The second student wrote, life is a disease for which the only cure is death. The third student wrote, life is a jail sentence we get for the crime of being born. Listen, people everywhere are trying to figure out what life is all about. Friend, all across America, these people are, they're grabbing and they're looking and they're searching and they're hunting for what makes life worthwhile. And many of those people cannot find it because they do not look in the right place. The church of the living God is the place 
where you can come hopefully and hear the gospel and hear about Jesus and accept him and have a changed life in your own heart and fill that empty void that is inside. Well, look at John chapter 10 and please stand with me in honor of the word of God. <clears throat> Verse 7. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, we know that, don't we? Jesus is the door. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have what? Life. And they might have it more abundantly. Amen. Let's pray, y'all. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to speak to us today. It will not be any more life as usual, Father. I pray for every one of us on this day that we indeed will be excited about you and live for you and love you. And we will experience the life of abundance. And Father, we praise you for what you've all done this last week, what you're going to do this week in the lives of our young people. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning and the decisions that will be made. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. There are three points to the message. I'm going to give you something about what the abundant life is not what it is, and then I'm going to give you a great example out of the Old Testament. So the first point is this, the opposite of the abundant life. Now, in our text, Jesus is speaking of the type of life that the enemy brings. The verse 10, look at verse 10 with me. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, we hear this, and we automatically think of the one called Satan. But in the context of these verses, Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd. See, there is a difference between the good shepherd and the thief. The thief represents all false teachers and all false religious systems. Friend, you got to be careful what you listen to and be careful what you watch. Because there are many, many false teachers around today. In the past, in the present, and in the future, there are thieves who will claim, have claimed, and will claim to be the promised one. You know what the thief comes wanting to do? To destroy the flock. The thief is a threat to the, to the sheep. And the thief in John chapter 10 may not be a reference to Satan himself, but you can mark it down this morning. False prophets... False messiahs, false religions all work under Satan's leadership. Friend, there are churches all across America and the world, and they never, ever mention the blood of Jesus. They never mention the victorious life. They never mention overcoming Satan. There are false religious places and cults all over the land. You know what, you know what Satan is? He's a master liar. He wants to steal the truth from you and me. By the way, he hates you, he hates me, and he hates God. He wants to destroy your relationships right now. He does not want what is best for each one of us, and I hope we realize that. And you know what else? He likes it when someone does not experience joy and peace in their life. Now, as a Christian, Satan wants to deceive you Listen to this, into being satisfied with less than God's very best for you. Now, please take note of that. God wants his best for you in your life. Satan wants to make it where you do not receive his best. You may have lived as a Christian in defeat so long that you may say, well, Brother Eddie, that's just a normal life for me. Well, good news, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. You may have been come, become satisfied with partial truth, partial obedience, partial love, partial holiness. 
You may be comfortable this morning, and you may have sunk down into the chair of lukewarm Christianity. Lukewarm, backslidden, out of fellowship, fleshly Christianity. You know, you can be saved and not ever experience the victorious life. And that, again, is sad to me. We come, we sing, we give, we teach, we preach, we do all the things we do in church, and we leave. And you know what? It seems like sometimes we're never changed. God wants to change every one of us, and he wants us to get in on the very best for him, the spirit-filled life, the life of abundance. Now, what the abundant life is not. It is not necessarily a life of comfort and ease. You know why I say that? Sometimes Christians need to go through the fire. Amen. Listen to what it says in James. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Some Christians go through the trials. Things don't go well for them one week, and they're just on a downhill pull. They feel like they're totally defeated. Listen, friend, God is already over, over everything that we seem to be under. Amen. He's already solved your problem. You just need to lay it down at his feet. It does not depend on outside circumstances. It is not what happens to you that is nearly as important as how you respond to what happens to you. You know, it's real easy when people are around you that are Christians, something goes bad, you can act all spiritual. Does that make sense? But sometimes when you're by yourself and something goes wrong, we just go off on a tangent, don't we? Thirdly, it is not glamorous or flashly. The Bible says, the Bible says, small gate, narrow way. And it's not obtained quickly. It is a process that often takes time. That is what the abundant life is not. I want to talk to you briefly about the, what the abundant life is. Look at John 10, 10 again. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, I've got some good news for everybody in the church house this morning. If you're not saved, you can be saved before you leave here. And if you're a Christian, you can begin right now, if you never have, living the abundant life as a believer. See, the abundant life is the life that Jesus expects each one of his followers to live. Jesus paid a high price, didn't he, in order that we might live the abundant life. And I love what John MacArthur said. He said, abundant life is not about having stuff. It's about having peace and joy and having God. Isn't that good? Yeah. The abundant life is not a life void of troubles and trials. And we think when we get saved, everything's going to be rosy. But friend, when you get born again, when you get saved, that's when the battle begins. That's when Satan's going to wear you out and attack you and try to get you to do things just like you did before. The word abundant in the original Greek language means very highly. It means beyond measure. It means exceptionally more. Now, friend, if you leave here today and you don't start experiencing the abundant life as a born-again believer, it's your fault. Okay? It's your fault and it's my fault if we don't do that. Living life to the fullest. The abundant life is only possible through the one called Jesus Christ. You remember the mule I talked about a while ago? You remember the old mule? That reminds me of a lot of a whole lot of Christians. They always seem down because they have never experienced this abundant life living. They're like the children of Israel in the wilderness, free from bondage, but they never receive what God wanted them to receive. You know what? When you get saved, and I like to say that, when you get saved, everything changes, and you're different. Well, Brother, I, Brother Eddie, I never got different. Well, you need to check it out. When you get saved, you're different. Yeah. Yeah. Amen in the balcony. Amen. I can't see you, but I know you're up there. 
Every Christian has new life, but not every Christian enjoys the abundant life. See, eternal life, we talk about that a lot. It does not begin, uh, listen, it does not begin when you go to heaven. Did you know that? Eternal life begins when you give your life and heart to Jesus Christ. We have some amazing things waiting on us for heaven. Boy, I've got a lot of them right now waiting on me. And, I, boy, if I kill over right now, it's no big deal to me. If you kill over right now, I just do your funeral, and we'll say some sweet things, and you'll be in glory. Is that okay? Listen, we've got some amazing things waiting on us in heaven. But, friend, we don't need to forget about the here and now of what God has for us. See, he has a plan for each one of us to live a great life right now. And it's to be enjoyed right now. I want you to turn with me, thirdly, to Genesis chapter 45. And I want to give you a great example of the abundant life. Genesis 45. This is that Old Testament example I was talking about. Genesis 45. And being born again is only the beginning of a wonderful new life. Now, Joseph, here in the Bible, made himself known to his brothers who had sold him into slavery 22 years earlier. Folks, that's a long time. I know people who have families that are, I don't know how many children in the families, and somebody did them something wrong five years ago, 10 years ago, and they don't ever talk, and that's sad. 22 years ago, he had been sold into slavery. They were afraid, but Joseph was trying to tell them that he forgives them, and they had accepted his forgiveness. And look at verse 5 in this chapter. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. We skip on down to verse 8. It was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, in verses 8 through 11 in this chapter, this is a picture of the abundant life Jesus wants each of us to enter into. If you know the story, a severe famine had hit the old country. Joseph's brothers, they were hungry, they were thirsty, they were tired, and they almost were dying. But Joseph, on the other hand, had plenty of food, plenty of water, plenty of shelter, and plenty of clothing. And you know what? Joseph would provide it all. Now, stop right there. Friend, when you give your life to Jesus, you become a child of the king. Are you with me? He is going to provide it all for you if you will allow him to. Just like Joseph provided for his family, God says, listen, if you love me and obey me and listen to me and give what rightfully belongs to me, I'm going to take care of you. Does the Bible say he owns the cattle on a thousand hill? Then what in the world are we worrying about? Now, it would be very foolish for Joseph's brothers to say, thank you, brother, but we don't need any help. We'll go back to poverty and we'll live and scrape one day at a time. It would be even more foolish for a Christian to say, Jesus, I want your salvation, but I don't want your abundance. Listen, I want to tell you, Jesus, again, he has a better life for you this morning. What was Joseph's, what was he saying to his brothers? He was saying, I'm your brother Joseph. I'm forgiving you for what you did. And God worked through you for what you did to get me to Egypt that I might provide for you. We're two years into a drought of seven years. You got five more years without any food. I am the only hope for your survival. Did you hear that? 
The only hope for survival for your life and my life and our families is the one called Jesus. The only hope for America is Jesus Christ. The only hope for all that we go through, my friend, is Jesus Christ. But notice this. Before his brothers could ever move to Egypt and accept his help, they first of all had to believe his words. The first step this morning we must take to enter the abundant life, Jesus promises, is to accept his word. We must believe the word of God. I'm amazed this when we read the word of God and we get in trouble and we push the Bible aside. We, we, we read the word of God and we don't believe that he's going to take care of us financially. We read the word of God and something happens in our life and our health and we don't think God has a plan or he's going to take care of us. We must believe his word. And I hold in my hand right here my most prized possession that I could ever have. And you have the same thing, I hope, in your home and in your hands. We must read it and we must learn it. Now, in my opinion, this is the number one barrier keeping many, many Christians away from the abundant life. We like what God has to say about heaven, but what does he have to say about holiness? We love to to know that we have eternal security in Jesus, but sometimes we don't like to hear about soul winning. We like to hear how much God loves us, but we don't care too much about him saying, you need to love one another. We like to hear about his redemption, but many times we don't like to hear about our responsibility. You can never enter abundant life living until you say by faith, Lord, I totally accept your promises. I totally believe your word. I trust my life right now to your word. Look at verse 13 in chapter 45. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Now, it was their responsibility, was it not, to let everyone know that Jesus was Lord, not Jesus, but Joseph was the ruler over all Egypt. They had to tell the good news. Joseph was alive. He was king over Egypt. He wanted to share his riches with them. And he wanted to take care of them. Now, twice in verse 9 and 13, Joseph said to do it with haste. And you know what the word haste means. There was no time to waste. Entering the abundant life means getting bold about Jesus right now. Let me ask you a simple question Is America in trouble? America is in trouble. America is going downhill, and I believe the hope of America is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he wants every one of us to eat on it and live it every day that we live. Uh, Entering the abundant life. Look at verse 18 with me. Bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. You will eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded, do this. Take carts and of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Bring your father and come. Also, do not be concerned about your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Now, what Joseph's brothers had to do, now listen to this, they had to leave everything behind. We've got to leave our old life And we need to accept the new life. You can never enter the spirit-filled life until you abandon the sin life. Everybody listen. If you're going to be a Christian, be a Christian. If you're going to be a Christian, be a Christian. I don't know what you do away from this church house, but God knows He knows how you talk, what you drink, how you use your mouth, 
how your example is. Friend, if you're going to be a Christian, you need to be the best Christian you can be. Oh, my goodness. You know, when you become a child of God, I know you've got these friends that you love dearly and you want to bring them to Christ. And have you noticed that if you're not very careful, if you can't get them to Christ, they might be bringing you back out into the world. Um, some of them we used to sin with and we used to drink with, party with. And the Bible says we can influence them, but don't, them, don't let them influence you. How many people do we know that have had their lives ruined because they ran with the wrong crowd? You know what I see today in this month and this year? Many Christians have so little time for church, so little time for worship, so little time for prayer and Bible study and spiritual growth, and it seems like we devote most of our time to ourselves and to our stuff. There's nothing wrong with things unless things takes the place of God. Look at verse 24 with me, and I'm about to close. So he sent his brothers away, and they departed, And listen what he said to them. See that you do not become troubled along the way. You know what Joseph is saying to his brothers, fellas? If you're going to live with me, you're going to have to learn to get along with one another. Makes sense. So on the way home, don't have a falling out. I mean, they were all so different. Judah was a ladies' man. I'm not going to list all of them off. Simeon was a goody two shoes. Benjamin, what was he? A daddy's boy. The boys loved to fight. They loved to fight. We Christians must learn to live in peace. There are similarities between Joseph's brothers and modern day Christians. You know, sometimes it's a tough time getting along. Joseph told them, don't have a falling out. And, we, and listen, I want to praise the Lord for our church. I mean, I believe right now with my heart we're at unity and we're at peace. If you cause problems, we'll just send you on your way. <laughs> Not really. But you know what I'm talking about. Abundant life living of Jesus. Abide in peace with brothers and sisters in church. And you know what that means? Sometimes you got to bite your tongue. Has everybody any, ever got on your nerves? Anybody? <laughs> Husband and wife doing that. Sometimes we got to bite our tongue. Sometimes we have to withhold our opinion. Uh, we got to be patient with others, don't we? I'm going back to John. The Bible says the thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. And the words in red, the letters in red, there's a song about that, isn't it? Some of you country folks know what I'm talking about. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, some of you today may say, Preacher, I don't need the abundant life because I've never been saved. Y'all, there's only one way to be saved. Jesus actually came and died for you. He was actually born of a virgin. 33 years old, they crucified him. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for going through that death for us. They put him in a borrowed tomb, and three days later, he came out of the grave. And, friend, he is alive. He is alive. He's so alive this morning. And he is the answer to your life and my life and to the answer to the world. He is the answer. So if you need to be saved this morning, we invite you to come. We're going to have an invitation. And why are we having an invitation? To invite you to come to Jesus. Not to come to the preacher or not to be seen, but to come to Jesus for eternal life. Now, many who are Christians across our nation, and some of you are here, are not living the abundant life. You are saved, but you're stagnated. 
You are born again, but you may still be a baby in Christ. Abundance is knowing where we are going and who we are going with. It is knowing who we have believed in and we are persuaded that he is able. Abundance is not an abundance of things. It is an abundance of, my friend, him. You know what? If you have abundance, you can sing in the prison. You can dance in the dungeon, even a Baptist. And you can walk through fire. Abundance isn't absence from life, but victory through life. And friend, life is hard, isn't it? Life is hard. And there are stumbling blocks all along the way. And Satan every day is throwing his darts at us. And he wants you and me to stumble and fall every single day. But hallelujah, I plead the blood this morning. And I have the blood of Jesus every day that will wash my sins away. Friend, I don't know about you, but I want to live the life of fullness. And I don't want to be defeated anymore. Well, preacher, are you still going to get defeated? I will, son. But God, the Holy Spirit, will pick us back up and keep us on that narrow road on the way to heaven. Friends, we got a job to do. I've never seen America in the shape that it's in right now. And when they come trying to destroy and influence the, cha- the, the minds of our children, we better put on the full armor. And we better go to war against the devil and the flesh and against sin. Yes. Abundant life living, it is yours for the taking. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. Thank you for salvation, and thank you, Lord, for the blessed life. Thank you, Lord, for the much more life in Jesus. Thank you for the life of abundance and the spirit filled. Oh, dear God, set us free this morning, Lord, and let us have true victory in Jesus' name. Amen.